speaking with you today on such an important occasion. We're here today to honor and celebrate our veterans who unselfishly placed their lives on the line. To honor and celebrate our veterans who unselfishly placed their lives on the line. I got a back seat to, to honor, and, and, and I'm sorry. We're here to honor our veterans who have placed their, their lives on the line for our freedom and to remember their sacrifices they made and the courage it takes to defend our country. Veterans Day, originally called Amnesty Day, was originally designated as a day to celebrate the end of World War I. The first World War ended November 11, 1918. Then in 1954, after World War II and the Korean War, it was renamed Veterans Day to honor all veterans who served America in war and defended democracy. So on this day, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, we are here to celebrate Veterans Day. And today we are honoring and saluting our women veterans. Let's give them a hand. Okay. And so we will start our program with the singing of the national anthem, followed by Lift Every Voice and Sing, which will be performed by Miss Sherry Wilson Butler, Philadelphia Jazz Songbird, immediately following the invita 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 mm, invocation, we will be, which will be delivered by Mama Christine Wiggins. And then we will show a brief documentary tribute to our founder, Dr. Mary Bethune, facilitated by Dr. Doreen Lowry. So, and now we'd like to begin by um, having Sherry Wilson Butler sing our national anthem. Thank you so much. And to all of the veterans and all of the men and women who still serve, we are so grateful for your service and so proud as Americans to see our people come to the forefront and serve our country. We cannot do anything that we do without you. So thank you. Okay, the first selection that I'm being requested to sing is um, the national anthem. So I will start with that first. Oh, say, can you see? By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stars, stripes, and bright stars through the perilous skies. For the land marks we watch were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land and of the free And the home of the brave. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as a roar. 
Link C. Sing a song full of the faith that the darkness has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory. Thank you for the honor. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Thank Sherry you. Wilson Butler, for that the beautiful singing of the national anthem Thank and you. our Black national anthem. And now we'll have the uh, invocation delivered by Mama Christine Wink Winkins. Greetings, green song. What a blessing to start off that way, Sister Sherry. That was wonderful. We can just take a moment. We want to first give honor to God. We want to bless the creator, ask for the blessing of the creator known by many names. Asante Sana, Father, for all the grace and cover that you have done for us to stand before our enemies and known and unknown and still be here this day. Thank you for your protection for all who have stood and are still standing against attacks of our mind, body, and spirit. That stood against evil all over the world and still stand in their communities, their homes, fronts, and their streets. We pray for all who went into darkness and stood for you, Father, protecting all of us and still stand for truth, righteousness, while still covered in the armor that you gave them. We are so proud to have people that stood beside you, listening to your directions and reference to go forward to protect each other and cover each other. And we give thanks for that cover. We give thanks for all that they did. We give thanks that you covered them and we give thanks that they were able to return home to their families. We also pray for all families, those who sacrificed for us, because had they not sacrificed and allowed their loved ones to go and protect and look over us and be there, we might not be here today. And many did not come home. So we actually ask prayer, Father, that all of those that lost anyone have an understanding and a comfort to know that that person gave their lives so that we yet could be here. We give thanks to all who understand our struggle is not that of flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against all authorities, against the powers of darkness in the world, but with the spiritual and everything that you give us, our heavenly redeemer, we will make it through. We ask you, Father, always to continue to cover us, to protect us, to see that we are on the right path. We will, in your understanding, cover ourselves by having the whole armor of God. We will wear the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace and the sword of the spirit. So that Father, every day we are covered so that we can continue to do what you have for us. And we will continue in the wars of the street and the wars of the world and the wars in the Holy Spirit to make sure that we, Father, make it home one day. With that, we ask that we thank you, we praise your name, and we ask your continual cover to all in here. We say, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Ashe, and thank you for that love. Thank you for that lovely prayer. And now I'd like to ask everyone to just take a moment of silence in memory of those who made the ultimate sacrifice, those soldiers who are still missing in action. Thank you. 
And now, uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Doreen Lowry, our first vice president for the NCNW Delray Valley section, who will introduce our documentary that we will be showing uh, this morning. Dr. Lowry, unmute yourself, please. Good morning, everyone. And how is everyone this morning? All my fellow fellow Marines and all my other armed force uh, personnel. The video that you're about to see was a wonderful find that we were able, uh, as we did some searching, to find out the relationship that our wonderful and illustrious leader of the National Council of Negro Women uh, and founder, Mary McLeod Bethune, was able to bring into uh, her vision of women in the military, especially Black women, through her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, like a lot of us already know, President Roosevelt in 1941 had put through an executive order that indicated that the military should, you know, uh, be uh, should be no uh, banning racial discrimination. But we already know that black soldiers, male and female, were still having to sleep in separate quarters and had uh, the kinds of jobs or uh, service duty that other people were not allowed to do. However, because of Mary McLeod Bethune's influence with Eleanor uh, Roosevelt. She was able to develop the whole concept of the black wax wax and something called the six triple eight. Let me tell you how bad these sisters were. These sisters came over on this uh, uh, a boat to overseas, first African American women to come to World War II to be overseas. And what met them was three hangers of unanswered mail that had been there for over a year. These sisters went through that 7 million pieces of mail and made sure they got to the proper soldier. Now, anybody that has been in the military knows how important that letter from home can be. So I, want, I don't wanna give you any spoilers about what you're getting ready to see, but you're getting ready to get a little bit of history and understand the quality and commitment of our founder, Mary Cloud Bethune, who said to us, she didn't leave success to chance. And that's what she did with these black women wax. So I'll introduce you to our uh, film for today. Thank you. All right, let's see if we can uh, restart this. I will share. Hopefully you will be able to see this. Let me make sure that we can, can everyone see this? What do I need to share? What started one year after the end of World War I became okay. in the late 1930s what today we call Veterans Day. It is a day when we celebrate veterans past and present who served or died during wartime or... All right, there I'm going to go over again. And I'm going to... What started one year after the end of World War I, which was known as Armistice Day, became in the late 1930s what today we call Veterans Day. It is a day when we celebrate veterans past and present who served or died during wartime or peacetime. For years, however, if you read the books, if you saw the newsreels, it was possible to think that Black folk never participated in defending the country. The fact of the matter is that since that first shot fired from Lexington Green, Massachusetts in 1775, African Americans have served and died for this country. Over 209,000 Blacks joined the Union Army or Navy during the American Civil War. Just under 2,000 African Americans were at D-Day on June 6. The notion of allowing Black folks to bear arms has never been a popular thing. But more importantly, 
The greater issue is that defending the country and full citizenship go hand in hand. If an individual is willing to lay his life down for the country, you cannot deny that individual full citizenship. And allowing blacks full citizenship has been an ongoing issue in our glorious past. There's even a lesser told story. African-American women serve and currently serve in the United States military. And the genesis began during World War II. But in order to understand the significance of their contribution, we must look at the years leading up to the conflict. So we have established the fact that Blacks have defended the country since the Revolutionary War up through World War I with the 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions. Now, in 1925, there was an army report entitled The Use of Negro Manpower in War. Its findings were essentially that you know, Negroes could move a box from point A to B, but you can't really depend on them to do anything beyond that. Of course, you know, Black folks blew that theory right out of the water. And after World War II, Blacks began to fight and die in disproportionate numbers. But, but um, well, that, that's a different topic for a different time. So Black folk were moving towards an opportunity to prove themselves once and for all that they were patriotic and that they were willing to fight and, if necessary, die for the country. But there's something else that is happening simultaneously. World War II would be a proving ground for women in general in both industry and military. And as a result of their efforts, it created opportunities for them after the war. Women worked overseas during World War I, working as volunteers. The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was established to work with the Army for the purpose of making available to the national defense the knowledge, skill, and special training of the women of the nation. The bill was introduced in Congress uh, May of 1941. Now, I have to say what was happening to women up until that point was a travesty. You know, we have not always been very kind to women, all women. Now, if black men were not treated well in the military, can you imagine what it must have been like to be a black woman in the military? The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was established on May 15th, but congressional members didn't take the idea of women serving in the military seriously until after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. And because of the exemplary efforts of those women up to that point, just over a year later, more legislation was introduced into Congress. And on July 3rd, 1943, the Women's Army Corps was established. Now, Instead of women working with the army, they would now be in the army. It was no longer volunteer for them. And it would afford them better pay, uh, better benefits, and protection equal to that afforded to the men. And yet there is another part of the story. This is not just an opportunity for women. This is an opportunity for Black women. Everything rises and falls around leadership. If an organization wants to be successful, it had better acquire great individuals at the top who are striving to improve their leadership on a daily basis. Well, in comes Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune. Now, you know, there's a lot I could say about her, but time will not permit. But let me just say, she started a school for girls and eventually co-founded what we know today as Bethune-Cookman University. In 1935, she started the National Council of Negro Women, which in 2020 celebrated 85 years in existence. I knew that she was a part of President Roosevelt's Black Cabinet, but what I didn't know is that she was very influential in choosing the other members in that cabinet. Mrs. Bethune also served as the special assistant to the Secretary of War for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. In the role as special assistant, she was responsible for helping establish a training school 
and recruiting black women for army training. And let me just tell you, Mrs. Bethune was no fool. She understood the weight of the situation and how important it was for those ladies to, to open doors for the ladies who would come after them. And Mrs. Bethune understood that. And so she handpicked 41 African-American women to be officers in the first officer's training class. 80% of those women had attended college and most of them had experience as teachers or clerical workers. What was Ms. Bethune doing? She was dropping the bomb. She was stacking the deck. There was too much riding on the line and she was not going, she, listen, she wasn't going to leave success to chance. If you want a team to win, you better put the best players on the field and that's what she did. Some of the African-American women who, who benefited from Mrs. Bethune were the women of the 404th Armed Service Forces Band. It was all female, uh, it was all African-American, and they were all talented musicians. Um, privates, uh, Mary Green, Anna, Mur uh, Anna Morrison, Johnny Murphy, and Alice Young were stationed at Fort Devens. Now, when they were recruited, they were promised training and skilled positions. But after they got in, they were relegated to orderly positions and they protested. And they, so folk are like, well, look, you just 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 going back to doing your job like we, we told you to do what we tell you to do and we'll forget all this. They're like, no, they took the court martial and they won. Doe v. Johnson Roundtree, recruited by Mrs. Bethune, she's one of Mrs. Bethune's protégés, served in World War II and went on to become a civil rights activist, an attorney, and an ador uh, she was also an ordained minister in the African-American Episcopal Church. Major Charity Adams started in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps and transitioned to the Women's Army Corps and was the highest ranking black female officer to go overseas. She commanded the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion, which uh, went overseas. When they got there, the mail facility was in disarray, and they ended up doing three eight-hour shifts to get the mail to the troop. Now, if you don't think mail is important, listen, you sitting over there, you know, in, in, in Bastogne, and you get it, you're not getting your mail from your family, that's, that's a morale builder. Della Rainey, Della Rainey was a Tuskegee Army nurse. She was the first African-American nurse admitted into the Army Nurse Corps. And she pretty much was over the Tuskegee Army nurses. Those ladies were nurses who worked down in Alabama and later went on to Walter Burrow. Those women are actually considered Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, there were just under 500 black nurses in the Army Nurse Corps during World War II. They needed more, but they just were not willing to bring any, any more um, black nurses in. I guess they had a quota. Now, why is this story important? And I know some people will say, well, it, it's all the same thing. It's all the same history. Why are you separating? Why are you segregating it? Well, I'm going to tell you why this story is particularly important. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of what we know today as African American History Month, said, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands in danger of being exterminated. Now that's not my word, that's Dr. Woodson's word. There are a lot of young folk out there who need to see themselves in history and they need to see themselves making history. General Colin Powell said it this way, given the train, the opportunity and the purpose, there is nothing that a person cannot accomplish. And just like Mrs. Bethune, we don't leave their success to chance. Now, did you hear what the man said? He said, we don't leave success to chance. And you have to understand how important that is. And we're going to transition into our panel in just a moment. But we thought it was so important that everyone had an opportunity to see a documentary that they may not have either access to or even think about listening to. I know I learned so much and I constantly think about 
all the opportunities I had because of the military. My shirt today says I am a woman. I served in the military. I am a veteran. And those are things I am proud of. But I need to say I am a Black woman who served in the military, and I am a veteran. Because I know there are so many young Black girls who look like me, and I look like them, who don't even understand the work that Black women and women, period, did while being a member of the military. I always tell the quick story that whenever my husband and I, when he was alive, would go to the free dinners or the free food on Veterans Day, they always turned to him and said, thank you for your service, sir. And he had never served a day in the military. And he would turn and say, no, thank my wife because she is the veteran. And that's the invisibility so many women veterans have had to deal with, not just from the beginning of World War I and II, but even now, so many women still do not step up and let the world know, I am a woman, I served in the military, I am a veteran. So I say thank you to Mary McLeod Bethune for opening the doors and the opportunity, because like the man said, she did not leave success to chance, and neither will we. Now, what I want to do now is begin to introduce to you uh, Patricia Alford. You ever have somebody that you meet first time and they become your sister from another mother? Well, this is how Patricia Alford, who is the uh, co-chair of the NCNW Delaware Valley Sections Program Committee and my late night partner on the phone, a wonderful woman and someone who you're going to enjoy as she introduces the panel, and as the kids say, we gonna get this party started. And, it did, and so I will introduce you now to Miss Patricia Alford. Thank you so much. Patricia, unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Patricia Alfred, and I hold the position of Chair of the Policy and Legislation Committee for the National Council of Negro Women, Delaware Valley Section. Today, we celebrate all United States veterans who worked and fought to keep our democracy. The Delaware Valley Section is proud to present to you this morning our five distinguished panelists, five Black women veterans who didn't leave success to chance. You will hear their firsthand experiences serving in the Vietnam War, Iraq War, and Desert Storm. These five women make up the many African-American women who were on the front lines keeping you and I safe from foreign aggressive, aggression, women who left who who proudly left the military and continue a lineage of success outside of the Army, Air Force, and the Marine Corps. So let's meet the panelists we have with us today. First, we have with us this morning Julian Black Bullock, U.S. Army. Julian Bullock is the CEO, president of Julian Bullock Enterprises, LLC, which is an entertainment and film production company based in Pennsylvania. While attending college, she worked as a reporter for Wall Street Journal newspaper. After receiving a degree in communications from LaSalle University, Julian got her start in filmmaking as an intern on Spike Lee's movie, Malcolm X. Her experience was working on her own or with others as an actress, writer, producer, director, and fight choreographer. choreographer. She holds two black belts, one in Taekwondo and the other in Wing Chun. Julian is the author of her memoir, Here I Stand, published in 2012. 
The book is the story of her upbringing with an African-American mother and her stepfather, who was a member of the Italian mafia. Her book is in development right now as a featured film. Jillian wrote and directed the documentary, A Filmmaker's Personal Journey. She wrote, directed, and produced the drama Spirit. And her last film, A Sense of Purpose, Fighting for Our Lives, which is a movie focusing on veterans, PTSD, and military sexual assault. She teaches screenwriting classes and works as a script consultant. And we welcome her today, Julian Bullock. Uh, thank our, you, Patricia. <laughs> our second guest panelist we have with us today is Constant Con uh, Cotton, U.S. Army. Constant is a retired Sergeant First Class U.S. Army Military War Veteran of the First Iraq War, Desert Shield, uh, Desert Storm War, 425th Medical Logistics Battalion, who has served as a part-time and a full-time soldier from 1988 to 2004. She graduated from the Lutheran Theolog Theological Sem Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She has served on many boards of many organizations, but her proudest one is a commissioner for the Camden County Human Relations Commission in South Jersey. She's a member of the Wounded Warrior Project and many military service organizations, which also includes the Disabled American Veterans. Constant is passionate about helping military veterans and their families obtain benefits from the VA. She is dedicated to helping society to better understand veterans' issues. And she published a book titled, On the Battlefield, Overcoming Challenges Associated with the Aftermath of Military Experiences. Welcome. Welcome today. Next. Our, on our distinguished panel, we have Renee Dickerson, U.S. Air Force. Renee Dickerson is a U.S. Air Force veteran who served in Desert Storm. Presently, she serves at the Department of Veterans Affairs Readjustment Counseling Service Program in Chicago Heights, Illinois, where she manages a team of clinical providers and power professionals. Renee specializes in combat and military sexual trauma. She is a native of Chicago and served in the Army for seven years. She earned her master's in counseling from Eastern Illinois University and is a PhD candidate at the Institute of Clinical Science Social Work. Ms. Dickerson is a member of the National Council of Negro Women a member of the American Legion, a member of the Disabled American Veterans and the International Association for Psychoanalytic Self-Psychiatry. Renee believes we can all live happy, healthy, and more productive lifestyles. In her words, working to grow into our better selves is a true possibility. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ms. Renee Dickerson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our fourth um, panelist today is the esteemed Dr. Doreen Laurie of the United States Marine Corps. Dr. Laurie is currently the director of the Pan African Studies Program at Arcadia University in Glenside, Pennsylvania and an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice. Beginning in November, Dr. Lowry will be the founding executive director of Arcadia's newly developed center for anti-racism scholarship, advocacy, and action. This interdisciplinary academic center will be dedicated to advancing scholarship on race, racism, and anti-racism in the past, as well as the contemporary 
world. She has a 32 year tenure at Arcadia and she has developed the university's first African-American studies curriculum and has de developed the university's first minor in Pan-African studies. <clears throat> Dr. Lowry is the 2010 recipient of the prestigious Lynn Bach Foundation Award for Distinguished Teaching and is the first African-American to receive the award at Acadia University. She is a recipient of Arcadia's Culture Ally Award for validating the lived experiences of all Arcadia University students. She was also the first African-American to serve on the university's faculty senate upon its development. Dr. Lori received her doctorates from the esteemed Department of African-American Studies at Temple University as well as an advanced certificate in culturally competent human services training from the Multicultural Training and Research Institute of Temple University. She has been appointed to many councils on diversity and racism. We thank her for her many years of dedication and we welcome you to the panel today. Our fifth panelist, but not last, even though she is, she's last being introduced, but she has a lot to say about what the military did for her and what she is doing with her life today. Um, this is, uh, the panelist is uh, Diane Carolyn Pixie Rowan, U.S. Army veteran. She served in the U.S. Army from May 1990 and was honorably discharged in September of 1991 after serving in Alabama, Virginia, and Texas. She served during Operation, De uh, Operation Shield Desert Storm in 1990 as a member of the 13th COSCOM RD in Fort Hughes, Hood, Texas. Upon her milk Upon her medical discharge from military service, she attended Temple University and majored in physical and health education teaching track while participating as a member of Temple University's women's fencing team. As an autoimmune disorder, as she um, was diagnosed with autoimmune disorder, which continuously threatened to end not only her dreams of becoming an educator, but her love of competing in her sport. With continuous visits to the University of Pennsylvania, and despite having multiple surgeries and chemotherapy treatment, Pixie, as she likes to be called, continued to achieve success both as an athlete and student. She is a physical education teacher. She established and volunteered the WS Panthers Club, where she teaches to all who wants to learn fencing. Her service to the community is known nationally and internationally. Presently, she is now pending the accreditation of Fencing Master. She would become the first woman of color to achieve the highest distinction in the sport of fencing. <clears throat> now, and we want to welcome you today, um, Ms. Uh, Rowan. Now we will, uh, we will hear from our distinguished panelists through questions. Beginning with um, Jillian, next Constance, then after that Renee, followed by Doreen and DC Pixie. I'd like to ask the question, what was your reason to enlist in the military and why did you choose to serve our country? Uh, hello everybody, I'm Jillian Bullock, uh, US Army. Um, I decided to join the military because I had two little kids at the time and my mother was taking care of them so I could go into the military. I thought I could have a better life for my kids, providing for them if I, was in the military. And I had, at first I wanted to be a career 
military person. Um, my experience was a little different than a lot of people's, which is why I wrote the movie A Sense of Purpose and about military sexual assault. Um, I had learned that so many people had, women had been sexually assaulted. That's why I did that movie. Uh, I had the experience, I wasn't sexually assaulted, but however, my sergeant did try to sexually assault me. I, and because I was a black belt, I was able to defend myself. Um, but because of that, I did that. I was discharged from the military because they said I was insubordinate. These are issues that we definitely need to be talking about. And this is why I do movies like A Sense of Purpose and I go around and I speak about military sexual assault. Um, but it wasn't all bad. My experience wasn't all bad in the military. I, to, to this day, I get up at four, four o'clock every morning without a alarm clock because of the military. And first thing I do is fix my bed. And um, it did teach me also how to be a team leader. I was a squad leader while I was in the military. Uh, and and I just did love being a leader and trying to teach the young ladies that were in my my uh, platoon how to be um, focused, how to get our jobs done efficiently, how to you know be out on time and do everything that we needed to do so we could um, come together as a group and be successful. So I was very proud of that. So it wasn't all bad and. Um, but I wanted to tell both sides of the story so people know everybody's story is not roses in the military. And I wanted to show that side as well. And also the benefits that I did learn while I was in the Army. Thank you. Constance? Greetings. My name is Constance Cotton, U.S. Army. I decided to join the military because my father served during the Korean War era. And I was fascinated by the stories that he shared. And I also attended Scotland School for Veterans Children. It's a boarding school in Pennsylvania from sixth to 12th grade. And I was a part of the JROTC program, which also kind of molded me for um, being in the military. Thank you. And Renee? Good morning, Renee Dickerson, U.S. Air Force. Although I did not serve in the war, I was a Desert Storm era veteran and a proud member of the Cafe Williams Buffalo Soldiers Combat Women Group in Chicago Heights. And the reason why I joined the military, although I was, I had, my father was very active in my life, I also had very active women in my life. My mother, my grandmother, um, my aunt, they all owned businesses. And so then, and they were pillars in their community and the church. And so I did not plan to join the military, but I thought it was the best way for me to continue my educate, education. I had just graduated from college. I know I needed to go further and I didn't want my parents to have to pay for it. And that's why I joined the military. And Dr. Lawry? Doreen? Yes, uh, and, my, and my story is probably a little different as well because I'm a, probably a couple years older than everybody on here because I was in the United States Marine Corps uh, during the Vietnam era uh, of conflict. And um, I was attending the high state university and I was getting on a bus every day from my parents' house, going up to a high state. And that just wasn't cutting it. That <laughs> just wasn't cutting it. Right out of high school, I went downtown to mail a letter. Back in those days, a letter was this long and white envelope. And we put it in a mailbox, okay, for those who may not remember. Uh, and I went downtown to mail a letter. And there was a big poster of this Air Force uh, man in, you know, in his full uniform. I put my head in, they talked to me, but for an 18 year old, four years was way too much time to give up my life. I walked down the hallway, there was a Marine Corps poster. I, and I put my head in and I'll never forget, the guy said, come on in, let me tell you about it. And it was a two year program. And I wanted to do more then what I saw, what I saw going on at Ohio State was all this protesting against the war. But I kept saying, but do we really know what's going on 
with our troops who are trying to go over there. Now, my brother was already had gone and come back. Uh, my father had been in the Second World War. So I grew up around military, but I really wanted to know what I could do during the Vietnam era. So what, you know, what any other, you know, Columbus, Ohio, little uh, a black nappy head little girl did, I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> okay. And so I joined it. Best move I ever made in my life. And it was a time of awakening for me, uh, as well as for the country. But my reasons were really to do more for the troops that were there and to also do as Julian talked about and others. I really wanted to find a way to help my parents because I knew I wanted to go back to school, but I knew that they weren't going to be able to afford it. And I knew that this was going to be another way for me to uh, do it. And I had in the back of my mind, I wanted to see Disneyland in California. And guess where my duty station was? El Toro in California. <laughs> so I was very lucky and I did, uh, I was in the Pentagon as well. And I was one of probably 12 a year who were able to obtain the uh, MOS that I wanted, which is the uh, job 3141. But guess what? I wanted to be a pilot and they wouldn't let me be a pilot. Because of the discrimination in 1966, still against Black women in the military. So I took the next best thing, and I was on the flight line, still with the planes, but not a pilot, not a pilot. Thank you. And um, DC Pixie. Hi, everybody. My name is Pixie Rome, and I serve the United States Army. My reason for joining the military was primarily what my other panelists have stated to further my education. Technically, I was a runaway. I was running away from the life that I was living. I had been an athlete. I've been a dancer for my entire life. And I wanted to prove to the world that I was so much more than just an athlete in the sport of gymnastics and also in the sport of fencing. Although I did have a successful athletic career, I still felt that I was not talented enough or even smart enough to attain a college scholarship. So then when the recruiters had visited our high schools and I asked questions about how can I earn money, guaranteed money for college, they talk about it, which made my final decision to join the military. My concern was I had just lost my father and I did not want any collegiate billing to fall on my mother. And I also wanted to prove that I was really special besides just being a talented gymnast and fencer. And that's basically why I joined the military. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The next question, what are the top skills you developed in the military that helped you in your personal and professional life and I'd like to direct this to Constance and then to Renee. Thank you. The top skills that I learned in the military um, was logistics. Uh, I worked at a med log battalion and we supplied um, medical supplies, biomedical needs and eyeglasses to um, the whole theater during the Gulf War. And the reason why that is that has been the best um, skill that I've learned. It, it has shown me um, how to procure and distribute um, supplies. It helps me to um, be a, an event planner and just doing all the background things to, to make things happen. So I'm very grateful. I've also um, driven for UPS as a driver. So. It, that for me, that's the best. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Renee? Well, my first duty station was in Spain, Madrid, Spain. And even though my job was as a clerk, um, due to my background in computers, um, I ended up with a um, top secret clearance in my job was to read um, the messages that came to the base um, 
And so before my commander found out and was able to, you know, give his orders, I had to review and highlight what was in was what was important. And so um, th that taught me that I can get up early in the morning, um, work under pressure, um, multitask, and work on the fire. Thank you. And which Thank has played so a much. major role in my life today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> The next question is, what advice would you give young women that are thinking about going into the military? And I'd like for Doreen and Pixie to answer this question. Wow. Um, there are so many opportunities for young women. There really are uh, in so many ways uh, today. One of the things I would say that if you are still trying to figure it out, the military many times is a great place to go to figure it out. It will give you an opportunity, one, to travel if you're lucky, but it will also provide you a way to be around all kinds of people and being able to work with all kinds of people. And I think in some ways we are limited today in doing that. So that's one of the things that it'll do for you. And it'll also, at least it did for me, the administrative leadership, all those wonderful skills, definitely you will learn. But it also gave me, and I think it will give other young women, a sense of there was nothing that I could not do. There is nothing that I cannot do. Like Renee said, getting up in the morning, doing all those things. Yes, Julie, I still make my bed. I put four corners. I still do all that, okay? But having that, and I had a healthy ego before I went in. So, uh, you know, but it, <laughs> it really made so that as a young woman, I never felt barriers. If I couldn't get over it, around it, I would dig a tunnel and go under it. That's what the military really gave me, that ability not to be afraid to tackle anything. And I think that is so important for young women, old women, women, period, to have that our piece in their arsenal of developing who they are. You've got to have the ability not to be escaped, not to be scared, and the confidence to know you may make mistakes. So what? A mistake is just a way of saying, I just did it wrong the first time. Let me try it again. And that's what I think is so important about women, young women looking at the military as a choice for their careers. Excellent advice, and uh, Pixie? I would like to follow up with Dr. Lowry. Um, the advice I would give to them is to take all the opportunities that are presented to them. Accept the possibilities of travel, travel internationally, not only domestically. Take the opportunity to learn skills that you probably would not learn if you went directly into college. Yeah. I know that, that was one thing that happened for me was something as simple as learning to drive a truck. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I would have never learned how to drive a truck or any vehicle that was a manual transmission, AKA stick shift, had I not been a member of military. Also, my advice is, is that the military helps you with organization. To this day, I'm very highly organized and it's transferred over into my professional life and also as an athlete. I truly believe that because of my experience in the military, it has made me not only a better educator, but also a better human and a better athlete. Thank you. Wow, excellent, excellent advice. Next question, what do you think the primary difference for male enlistees versus female enlistees and I direct this to Jillian and Constance. Well, I know when I was in the military, um, they called the girls Josephines and the guys were called Joes. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the one thing that the, our sergeants, drill sergeants used to tell us is that men are, um, they used to say that the men are knuckleheads compared to women. They said women catch on so much faster we work better as a team. 
Like if we had to take a big boulder and move it, we might not be as strong as the men, but we would figure out how to build a apparatus to move that boulder. Um, and we just, they said we worked more in sync with each other. Um, so that's the difference to me about the men um, is that they said the men were just hard headed and they would have to be telling them over and over and over again um, to do the same job. And they would tell the women and we would just formulate a plan <laughs> uh, yeah. in, our, in our group and we would get the job done sometimes faster than the men. And we, we were proud of that. We were proud of that when we could um, you know, march better than the guys in our in our platoon, or and get out on that field and shoot really well with our weapons. And um, uh, the only thing that we didn't do as well with the men is throw the grenades when we were in practice. Just didn't have a lot of women didn't have the upper body strength, so that's the only thing. But everything else, we really were toe to toe with the guys, and we um, they had a lot of respect for us. Um, and you know, I would tell the women because, like I said, I was a platoon leader. I would say if you have to cry because something's going wrong. You know, yeah. go in the barracks and cry. Don't cry out in front of the men because we, we just <laughs> want to have the, the parents that we're strong and we are, yeah. and you know, we're going to support each other. So if you have to cry, I didn't say don't cry, but cry in the barracks, cry behind a tree somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and then come back strong and let's get this done because we, we had a pride in my platoon. We had a pride that we were going to be the best of the best. And, you know, when you, again, when you go into the military, you have that, that attitude that um, we're going to be, you know, like you said, the best of the best and what we do, we're going to show out strong and we're just going to be proud of ourselves and we're going to be proud of each other. Wow, who rules the world? Hey. Hey. Constance? <laughs> yes, um, I think the difference between uh, men and women in the military is first, you know, the military is a, a male dominated organization and I believe that it caters more to men. <laughs> And the reason why I think that is when women came forward with issues, a lot of times our voices weren't heard because the men either didn't understand what we were saying or, or didn't want to understand because it was their world and, and they allowed us to be a part of it. I think that women um, can be challenged in the military because we're prone to having um, sexual violations um, done towards us, um, whether it's um, military sexual trauma, whether it's um, you know being in a room full of men that, um, that they're, they're saying sexual jokes that makes us very uncomfortable, whether it's you know us having to prove that we're we're good enough or that we belong, and you know, from a racial standpoint also, you know, a lot of times, you know, I felt like there was a disparity with promotions. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we would be looked over or just, um, just dealing with racism and discrimination. So those are the main um, differences that I found while I was in the military. Wow, truth ladies, that needed to be told. Now our next question. What did you find that was the hardest adjustment returning to civilization or civilized life? And I'd like to, um, for Renee and Doreen to answer on these topics, on this question. I think for me, the hardest adjustment um, to becoming a civilian is um, after dealing with the micro and macro aggressions in the military, which also exists in the civilian life. And, um, but handling um, what we experience in the, mil in the military um, and um, regardless of even more, more aggressive in the military. In the civilian life, um, the lack of order, the lack of um, attention to detail, a lot of things that became embedded and, and ingrained in us, um, my experience in working in the civilian world uh, 
I did not experience initially. And I think that's when I realized, oh, there's something wrong with me because I don't should not have to handle um, the micro and macro aggressions that are on steroids um, that I experienced in the military and the civilian sector. And so it was kind of hard to come down to be, um, it was okay to, to be in the civilian sector. And, uh, and I, I am amen in everything Renee said, because you know, she is so right about those microaggressions. But also uh, for me, it really was hard to deal with the aspect that because I wanted order and a level of professionalism, I was seen as bossy and too aggressive and uh, constantly asked, was it that time of the month for me? Okay, that was actually what the, I got those kinds of questions in my civilian jobs because I was always about, well, we have to have this in at this time, we've got to do by this time. And it really was hard. The funny one, and I know all of my uh, other with female best would probably laugh at this one. I did not realize that those ugly black Oxford shoes should not be worn in, in, <laughs> in civilian life, all right? Because they were so comfortable, I would put them on and wear them and finally told, nah, Doreen, that don't work. That don't work. So again, and not understanding the level of camaraderie that I had with men, that men were seen as, I could not, it was hard for me to really understand why I couldn't be buddies with a man, okay? With no sexual overtones, just being, you know, we buddies, because in the military, everybody got paid at the same time. Everybody knew what they were doing on their jobs. So there was a community and there was uh, the respect that Jillian said that they had for us because we were always making sure things were done right and to come out and not have that same kind of camaraderie with men and women was a joke to me because again, I wondered where that village was, which is why I went into the reserves. I was like, I got to find that somewhere. And I chose to go into the Air Force Reserve to get that same belongingness that I was not getting in civilian life. Renee, well, are you with me? Today Renee? we are hearing. <laughs> today we are yes. hearing uh, these words of truth. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is. What did you enjoy the most about military life? And um, I'd like for Pixie and Jillian to uh, answer these two. These, uh, this, last, this next to last question. Um, I, think it's, I think I loved driving different vehicles, everything from trucks to forklifts, just driving far distance, I learned that I love, I'm a great distance driver. I had no problem driving materials from Fort Hood, Texas down to Houston Seaport. I just love driving on the open road. Um, so that was one of the things I enjoyed about military life. Uh, I also uh, love being a part of a community where I had access uh, to work in Department of Defense schools. I knew when my military service was over that I was indeed wanted to be a teacher and I was privileged uh, to go inside uh, DOD schools uh, for military children and able to do different activities with them. It kind of expanded my family in that aspect because now I had other military families that I would link up with since I was so far away from my very own family. And I love the travel aspect, aspect and learning about different places that I've never been before. Um, and I also love being part of the military, the, the local uh, post teams, uh, such as I was part of Army cheerleading for Fort Hood Tankers. I was also part of uh, Army bowling team. And these are things I never would have um, had a chance to participate in 
had I not been in the military, particularly, uh, believe it or not, army bowling. That's something that just was not a part of my life as a child in New York City. So uh, those are some of the things I really enjoyed about being in military life. Thank you. Great, great. For, for Jillian? Me, yeah, for me, you know what? I was like, I'm a, a martial artist and I was a competitive martial artist and, and Taekwondo and Wing Chun. So military, the PT, I loved it. Like, you know, we would go running every morning. We would have to run to the mess hall. Um, and I was really in great shape um, doing that. So we sang, you know, we do cadence while we're going, mm -hmm. singing cadence while we're going. I, I loved it. It was so, we were one. We were singing together. We're marching in our boots together or, or running, jogging um, and learning new things. Learning new things like how to take apart your weapon and put it back together in a certain time frame was absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> um, it just taught you discipline. It taught you how to do new and different things. Um, like I said, you know, learn how to throw a grenade and far enough that you don't blow up your own team was pretty cool too. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, every, even things that were difficult, uh, I think like Doreen was saying, like the gas chamber, you know, the, these were experiences that you would normally be under, you know, you have to say your name, rank and serial number before you can get out. If you don't mm -hmm. say it, you don't get out. And don't get out. Up some, some females passed out because they didn't, get, they didn't, couldn't get, couldn't get out. And that showed you discipline, and it showed you how to command control over your body, mm -hmm. uh, which makes you a very strong person in real life. And when you got back to civilian life, because then say your name, rank, a serial number, once you take your gas mask off and that gas is hitting you, you feel like you're dying, to be able to slow yourself down and to get it out, breathe and get it out. And so you can get out, it, 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 it lent me to discipline uh, when I got out the military. Um, and even helping me raise my children. It, um, it helped me with those things because instead of, again, being a black belt, my hands were registered as a, a lethal weapon. So I really couldn't, you know, smack my kids around like some people did when they were disciplining their kids. So what I would make my kids do is push ups. Yeah. And we would do it the way we did it into the military. We go one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two. That's what my kids yeah. did. Yeah. That's what my children did. Uh, they hated it. They rather I got a switch and me spank them, but it's it's a form of discipline, and it really worked well as far as those things in my life, learning new things and and raising my kids like that to help them be more disciplined and focused as well. Patricia, you got to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We get to our last question, and. Um... I want everyone to answer this question. If you had to do it over again, would you still enlist in the service? And we'll start it off with Jillian and we'll keep going straight down. Unmute yourself. Technology. <laughs> All right. For me, for me, I probably, even though I learned a lot of great things, and I, for me, I probably would not. The sexual assault almost happened event really um, shook me, really um, did some damage to me and me mentally, emotionally. And when I got out, I had to have to get therapy for a while for that incident. Um, like I said, because I defended myself against a drill sergeant, um, I was demoted in rank and I was, I was discharged. Um, something totally obviously unfair like um, Constance was talking about the sexual assault the sexual you know they they can get away with whatever they they do and he did the sergeant got away who how many others he's done that other women he's done that to um, so for me I, I would not because that like I said it was like I said if I didn't know martial arts I'm sure he would have raped me I said, no, my drill sergeant would have raped me but because I did know that I was protected in that way but the military didn't protect me when I was saying what happened. They didn't believe me. They believed the drill sergeant. And I got, like I said, demoted in rank. And I got an a, a honorable discharge, but I still got discharged when that's, that wasn't my plan. I had planned to stay in there for a while. So for me, um, I, I couldn't say I would go back and do it again, no. Constance? Yes, I would absolutely serve in the U.S. Army again. 
despite um, the challenges and, and the medical issues of um, causing me to be medically retired, um, my, my time in the military and my contributions during the war um, has been very rewarding for me and my family. Thank you. Thank you. And Renee? I would have to say, absolutely. I would, I would join the military again. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think I am the person I am today because of my military experience, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and uh, yes, the military is still rather misogynistic. It's still rather um, man's world. Um, and sexual assault, sexual harassment still occurs regardless of the media attention and the, um, the Pentagon and the Congress uh, promise to bring it into it. Um, as women, we have the right to serve in the military and we're excellent at it. And we deserve all that we can experience and, and achieve due to our military service. I've also had the opportunity to meet some of the most amazing women. Uh, and I know for a fact I would not have, and all of these women have served um, and as well as, as men. And I'm able to do the work that I do today because of my military service. So I would do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Doreen? Um, a thousand times, yes. I would definitely uh, re-enlist again. I too, like uh, Jillian, I really had planned on uh, uh, staying in. I was going to uh, make it a career and stay in, but I fell in love or lust. I'm still not sure which one it was. Uh, and uh, back in those days, you could not stay in and be pregnant. Now you can. They even have uniforms. So that if you are carrying a baby, but back those days, no, 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 that was not happening. But I would have definitely stayed in uh, and I would definitely would have, uh, um, I would re-enlist again, because again, I don't think I would be the person in many ways that I am today uh, without the confidence that the military instilled in me. And also the, I like being part of a legacy that's just how I'm wired, that I think as Black people and Black women in particular, we are always trying to develop pathways to a legacy. And I understood even then, I didn't know anything about Mary McLeod Bethune and her relationship with the military, but I understood my role as a Black woman there was definitely going to be making a pathway for other Black women. So, and as well as in my family, I knew it was a big deal for me to be in the military and for my parents and my, you know, aunts and uncles to say, oh, Doreen, she's in the Marine Corps. That was a big deal at that time, 1966, 67, 68. So again, for me, definitely would enlist, probably would, I've been in the brig a couple of times by now, but I would have definitely... <laughs> I would have definitely be re-enlisting and would want to serve in the social actions component, uh, working with diversity, equity, and inclusion. That would be probably the path that I've taken in civilian life would definitely be the path that I would have continued in the military. Thank you. And DC Pixie? Despite um, the ups and the downs I experienced during my service, I would, I would do it again. Um, before I was medically discharged, I was actually a candidate for officer candidate school. And I was really looking forward to being a military officer. However, um, life wouldn't be as it is today, um, even with my sudden discharge from the military. Um, being part of the armed forces has greatly enhanced my life. Uh, there have been some times trials and tribulations, but because of the discipline that was continuously enhanced 
uh, while, while I served in the military, it taught me that I can survive and I can do anything. That includes what my medical conditions are and how to live with them and how to adapt to ever-changing situations. So yes, I would do it again. The only difference is that I probably would have went uh, ROTC route instead of just enlisting. Thank you. Oh, wow, this has just been so enlightening, so much information, so much understanding. Um, I wanna thank all these beautiful ladies who didn't leave success to chance. These women were outstanding in the military, good, bad, or indifferent. They made a difference for the next generation of young black uh, military women. And they made a difference in the life when they came back to the civilian life. And we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for serving our country and making sure that we were free. Um, we will now have our closing video to salute all of our veterans. And then that'll be followed by the closing remarks from Juanita Jen Jenkins, president of the Delaware Valley National Council of Negro Women, our leader. Thank you. And thank you, Pat, for monitoring this session and thank Thank, thank all of the veteran uh, panelists who I know each and every one of them personally, and I know their stories and they're amazing women and um, they're, they're amazing friends. And I, I'm just so excited that they were able to be here today to share their story. And I'm excited that they didn't give up, um, they, they didn't give up on their chance of success because each of them have a very successful story. So now I'm going to uh, well, hold on, hold on for a minute. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. I don't see any question. I just see some comments. Um, uh, Trina uh, said that she didn't know that about pregnancy in the US Army that they sent women back home. And Dr. Lowry responded to her to okay. confirm that yes, they told her to go home and be a wife. <laughs> you, know, you know that's wrong. You know that was wrong, you know. And wait a minute, Laura, let me tell you what was really ugly about it. They didn't send me home because it took them four months to determine I was pregnant. I will never forget them putting me in a room with the Navy. You know, the Navy took care of the Marines, right? All right. They, the guy said, you go pee in a jar, I'll go pee in a jar. If it comes out the same, you're not pregnant. I came out. Apparently, our stuff looked the same. I walked around pregnant for four months. They kept taking my uniform out, <laughs> okay? And I fainted. When the then President Johnson came to inspect the troops, and as he walked past me, I went into a dead faint. And when I woke up, I said, did the president see me pass out? And they said, no. Nope. And that's when they determined, by jolly, by joy, you're pregnant. No, stop. I was pregnant. And then they gave me a discharge and said, go home. <laughs> yeah. And correction, um, uh, Trina said that she didn't know that they had the uniforms now, which is a good yeah. thing. Because I could yeah. imagine a woman trying to fit in her regular <laughs> uniform and being pregnant and, you know, and, and um, suffocating the baby that she's carrying. Well, also, um, she, uh, there's a remark from, let's see, Constance, Sheila, Sheila McMillan said, um, when you... When did you attend Scotland School for Veteran Children? She said she has three children who are attending as well now. Wonderful. I attended Scotland School from 1978 to 1984. Thank you. Fantastic. A great school. I remember actually uh, recruiting there when I was a recruiter at Temple. Um, and on the battlefield, overcoming challenges associated with the aftermath 
of military experience paperback. Yes, constant, um, Const constant Cotton has her book. I have her book. Actually, I was going to run. It's in the bedroom because I was reading it last night. I got it. She's holding it up. Uh, you can order it from Amazon. And I'm sure that uh, Julian book also is out. Is your book out, Julian? No, unmute yourself. I'd rather they see the movie uh, deals with the military sexual assault okay. and all that on Amazon, yeah. A Sense of Purpose. I'd rather they go see that on Amazon. And I had the opportunity to actually debut um, Julian's movie at Temple when I worked yes. as the uh, veterans uh, administrator in the Military and Veterans Services Center. It was it, When it first came out, we actually showed her film. Um, and it is, a, um, it's, it's, it's so real, you know, it's, and, but it can be a trigger. It can be yeah. a trigger for some women who have experienced that. So I, I, I must, um, you know, um, warn you of that. Um, so if any of y'all can, if y'all go see it, A Sense of Purpose, Fighting for Our Lives on Amazon. If you see it, just leave a comment. It helps with the ranking of the movie. <laughs> so. Okay. It's wonderful. There, there is a question to say, do you produce films only for military stories, Julian? Oh no, we just got finished doing one. Um, I just got finished filming. It's, it's a psychological thriller. It's called A Cup Full of Crazy. And the next one we're doing is a boxing movie, a drama. It's gonna be a boxing movie. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's all all different type of movies. So it's not just uh that was just that one because I wanted to do something to honor the veterans who have served and and highlight sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military. Um, but it is it is a feature. That's not a documentary. It's a feature. So we do have exciting moments, sexy moments, fun moments, everything. <laughs> Great. Thank I, you. I smell a uh, the uh, uh, a viewing party in the works, um, if at all possible, where we can get together as NCNW Del Val and celebrate the work of this black uh, black veteran here on this panel. So if that's at all possible, please let us know. Well, because... yeah, we, we can talk about it. I just got, a, I just got an email from a, another veteran organization in Chicago who wants me to show the film there for, his, for the veterans there who have um, PTSD. I said, we got to have a psychologist there that we're going to do that. To, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Mm. So, sure. so yeah, so we can talk about, about it, Juanita. We can talk about it, how to get it together, okay? Absolutely. Renee may know about that because she's in Chicago. I'm the one. I got to respond to your email. Oh. <laughs> Great. Well, this has been an exciting uh, conversation with our women veterans sharing their story. Uh, they did not leave success to chance. We're, we're happy that our guests... Um, um, has hung in here with us and, and joined us today on this Veterans Day. I can't tell you the challenge that it was to do a virtual event because we are so used to doing in-person oh. events, but due to the situation that we're in with this pandemic, um, we, 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 we decided to go this route and we really appreciate all those who were here to join us. And before I turn the program over to our president of the National Council for Negro Women, Delaware Valley, Se Delaware Valley section, I want to um, I, I want to play this um, tribute song by Nora Jones. So bear with me um, with the technology uh, challenge that I have. <laughs> okay. You're doing great, Laura. Thank you. I'm going to see if this opens up. I probably have to stop it. Okay. And then we share again. Share, yeah. We can hear it. You can hear it? Mm -hmm. But it's got, a, it's got a picture. I am. I'm giving it. Bring it in. All we've been given by those who came before the dream of a nation where freedom would endure the working prayers of centuries. Brought us to this 
Wow, I that was that was really beautiful, Laura. Thank you for sharing that with us and uh, kind of bringing to home once again the importance of our need for our voices and our stories to be highlighted and amplified in this hour. Um, and I, I, I thank every single one of our panelists. Dr. Doreen, Sister Dr. Doreen Lowry, uh, our sister Pat Alford, our sister uh, Pixie Roan, our sister Julian Bullock, our sister Constance Cotton, our sister Renee Dickerson, and our extraordinaire 
uh, chair, uh, Laura Reddick, Media Outreach and, and Relations. I thank each and every one of you for what you gave in service to give to others so we can continue to understand that there are there are some more battles to fight, including making sure that the optics continue to include our voices, include our stories, and understand the contributions that were given and continue to be given to on behalf of this country. Um, if you are not familiar with NCNW, I wanna I wanna encourage you, click on a link. Um, and begin to discover more about the National Council of Negro Women, Delaware Valley section uh, as well. So you might begin to understand the charge that we, we undertook as we decided to join this organization. And it, it, at the very core of it is our American heritage to create a society that is inclusive and supportive of everyone, all of our citizens. And so we make this pledge at every, at every meeting, uh, the executive board meeting, our committee meetings, and our general body meetings. That, that our next general body meeting will be on November 20th. I encourage you all to join us at that time. I encourage you all to uh, join and seek membership and to also tell others that there is a work yet still to be done um, that will encourage, once again, the voices and the perspectives of Black women in a variety of different areas to be made known and to be amplified. And so without further ado, I'd like to thank not only our panelists, but our attendees for joining joining and hearing and hopefully taking the message forward from this point about the experiences of, of military life, um, that there is robust and, and, and fruitful life after military service, and that there is still yet more to be done. And so I thank you all at this point, and I encourage, I look forward to uh, opportunities for all of us to connect once again. Please don't be a stranger. Please connect. This is our first interaction, but this cannot be our last. We for we have much to do. I thank you all. And and thank you so much, President Juanita Jenkins, for that wonderful, wonderful closing. And again, we thank you from the Delaware Valley section for your service today, veterans all across America. This is your day. Don't forget all the free coffee, the free food that's out there, the free discounts. Take advantage of everything. You deserve it. You deserve everything. We can't thank you enough for the sacrifices uh, you made. And also let us also keep in mind and, and pray for those who made the ultimate sacrifice who are not here with us uh, to, to celebrate this day. Uh, you can check out this uh, this whole program again on Facebook. Yep. We did uh, do this Facebook Live. I also put in the chat our website, uh, www.delawarevalleyncnw.org. So you can check out our website, find out everything about us and um, check out our media uh, section. Um, we are part of the Good Health Wins uh, program where we are promoting uh, 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 people to to get their shots and um, so that we can go back to living in a normal society at some point, you know, in the future. So we thank you again. Enjoy your day. God bless America. God bless our veterans and ladies. God bless you. I love you and have a wonderful day. Thank you to the program committee. You all are wonderful. Pat Alfred, Carlina Sanders, uh, Laura Reddick, thank you. But y'all, we made it happen. <laughs> we made it happen. And also, we have a part two of this program. It is not over for us. Just like you yes. can to eat. If you want to join us again this evening, we're doing a program called A Band of Sisters for the City of Philadelphia Women's Commission and the office of the City Council Office of Veteran Affairs. And we have uh, five outstanding uh, guest veteran speakers there to tell their story 
about serving. So if you if you if you want to continue to enjoy uh, women, we are honoring women veterans today. We have another program from four to six. Just check out our website or our Facebook page, and we hope you can join us. Have a great day. Go get some lunch. Yes, please. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye, bye. Bye. Everybody go out. Bye. Take care. Bye, bye, Jelly. We're gonna let everybody. Bye, bye. We're gonna let Thank the guests you. out. Let the guests out. That is just us left, Laura. In a minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. I see a lot of my Temple family came on. So happy to see them. Atlanta came on. Yes. I guess we can. All right. Okay, now we know you have to go and be on Word. Are you doing it virtually? It's just... I are you doing I, it virtually? Or you I was, I was told to be there at two o'clock, so I, I'm gonna get going. Oh, okay. Oh, you could have done it on virtually. I, well, I don't know why you can do it virtually. No, I, I, I think that she wants her to be on the camera. You know how like you can the live. Okay. But you can I be said, on camera the other way too, but that's so okay. she can get down there because we're right here at 95. So she can get down there in about 15. Okay. Minutes. Drive okay. safely. Have a wonderful Bye. day. Bye bye, Thank Pixie. You. Bye bye, Pixie. And um, where's Renee at? I want to make sure. Where's Renee at? Renee's Renee left. Oh, my Lord. All these texts are coming in. People saying you know it, that on Facebook. Oh, get out. Fantastic. Yeah, my, my phone is like blowing up. <laughs> okay. Oh, you, you know, know what? Wait a minute. I need to.